uh, I want to introduce to you uh, a customer, Dave Warner. This is Dave. Uh, Dave Warner's worked for Forcia or Forcia. I guess we, there's some discussion about whatever you want to call it. Okay. <laughs> Dave's worked at Forcia for 16 years at their Columbus Tech Center, where he initially designed and installed a number of exhaust system test cells and equipment. He's now involved in the collection and processing of proving ground data for the development of durability tests of both light and heavy vehicle system, exhaust systems. The example he's going to show us today was done in, uh, in part with uh, Everardo Maya, who's a uh, co-author and back here in the white. And uh, uh, this is going to demonstrate how ENCODE Glyphworks is used at Forcia to remove temperature effects in measured strain. Uh, uh, John Menifee, uh, also with our team in uh, Columbus, who actually did the pi uh, Python script programming. Uh, talk about some motivations with this. Uh, exhaust system road load data basically uses a bypass system, and you can see this little pipe coming out on, on uh, the side of the exhaust system, and then we'd put a steel plate right in front of the, uh, where that weld seam is, and the exhaust would come in from the manifold and then go out to the side and the rest of the system down there will just use regular strain gauges that you're all familiar with, the bonded resistant strain gauge. And in fact, you can see one on the bracket and one on the outlet of the uh, uh, converter body there. But on the inside, on the front end, you'd want to have hot strain gauges because it gets really hot. We're talking things go up to 750, 650 C there. And this is uh, a typical example of a bonded uh, or of the hot strain gauges that we're using. Over on this side right here is the gauge. There is the uh, other side of a half bridge. And the brown wire in the middle is a thermocouple. And coming out is a gas thermocouple. And on the other side of it is yet another strain gauge, which uh, is exactly the same. It's another uh, hot strain gauge. Uh, there's a lot of problems with it. Bonded resistance strain gauges burn up. You get to 200 C, they're gone. Uh, but hot strain gauges are a lot more expensive. They require a thermocouple. You're going to need another channel to measure that. Though in this case, I'm using one thermocouple to handle both of them. And they require a lot of special processing because they're very nonlinear. And this is going to show how we've been using ENCODE for processing and hopefully a little bit how we develop that. Even when the temperature is dynamically fluctuating over time as you drive around a proving ground. Some strain gauge basics. You guys have all seen the Wheatstone Bridge, the little bonded resistant strain gauge that is typical. It's a little grid. As you stretch the grid, the resistance goes up. As you compress the grid, when it's laid on a piece of metal, the resistance goes down. And uh, if all these resistors were 120 ohms, for example, with the resistor, the bonded straight gauge is just at rest. Everything's zero. You have no output at all. The relationship between the constant proportionality, because this is very linear, is GF, and there's the formula for it with respect to the resistance, the length of the grid, and how much you're changing that length. Here's again that same single arm circuit, but now we've got a bunch of long lead wires. Okay, so this. Uh, gauge factor now goes to the K, which it takes into account the fact that you've got these long lead wires running around. Okay? So if I applied this same little bonded resistance trade gauge, you guys have all seen that I use 10 volts for my excitation voltage EEX. And they're all 120, but I assume that when I push down on this beam coming out with a force F, it goes up to 121. Uh, then I do all the math and, and everything for two bridge divider, and I come out with a single gauge. It's going to read uh, minus 0 0.202. Now, if I mount another strain gauge on the bottom and I push down, the top one's going to go up. We're all familiar with that. It goes up to 120 ohms, let's say. It goes up one ohm to 121 ohms. The bottom one goes down one ohm, and uh, to 119, and I do all the math again. On the left, R2 and R3, they're our bridge completion. 
resistors, they're still 120 ohms, and so now I get 0.04. So basically, I've kind of doubled my sensitivity. Okay? Now we're going to apply heat. We still have our one arm bridge again, and we apply heat, but the thing about resist bonded resistant strain gauges and all strain gauges, they're much, much more sensitive to heat than they are to strain. Big problem, because actually I'm using 10 ohms here, it might be 100 ohms on this kind of a scale, easily. So, but here's the math. If I use 10 ohms, I've got 131 now ohms for my bonded resistant strain gauge, one ohm for the bending, but 10 ohms for this big thermal thing. And I don't know what, I, what to do with that, because now I've got 0.219. So I'm 0.02 to 0.219, I'm two orders of magnitude uh, up, or one order of magnitude up, and really, this might be 100 ohms resistance change, and so I'd be up even higher. So that's a real problem when you start getting things hot. So here's a hot strain gauge. Suppose I have two active arms, and they're both hot, but only one of them is bending. That's the secret to these uh, Kiowa uh, strain gauge, how the Kiwa half bridge gauge that I showed you in the very first slide is working. One strain gauge is bonded to the metal of the part, and so when we start bending the part, it's responding with strain. When we start heating that part up, it's also responding to the heat. That little cylinder that you saw in the picture is, a, is responding only to the heat. There's no strain in there, and there's actually a little bridge inside those things that has got little tungsten wires inside the sealed part. So if the temperature change is constant, then I'm going to get 10 ohms on both sides of that bridge, and I go back and I do my math, and I'm almost back to where I started. I'm at 0.019 and 0.0247. But that's because I haven't taken into the fact the lead wires are changing. They're also hot and responding with temperature. Everado, you ready? Okay, so this is essentially what we really have in a hot strain gauge. We have um, a uh, heated part where the strain gauge is, heated part where that little cylinder is, but it's sliding inside that little tube there and it responds to no strain. And then I've got a heated lead wire going off and I'm measuring the thermocouple so I can know what the heck that temperature is everywhere. Okay, so, and here you can see these two lead wires from the two hot strain gauges that were on this part are both glued down to the can with little, uh, and they're metal, and they're picking up heat off the can. There's little U-shaped things, and we spot weld those to the can. You can see them right here, and, and we have a little spot welder that, that does that for us. Okay, so a real hot strain gauge. Everado just passed out data sheets you can pass up and down the rows for the, the Kiowa half bridge shave gauge. Lots of people make hot gauges. I'm using this one because it's a pretty uh, complex example. And uh, we've had pretty good luck with these things because they're a half bridge rather than a quarter bridge. But they work just like any strain gauge. Metal bends, goes in tension, goes in compression, the resistance changes, okay? And there's lots of people that also make quarter bridges. They lack that thermal dummy bridge that's responsive only to temperature and not to strain. Okay, and so in many ways they're not as responsive because you aren't canceling out the strain. You now have to figure out how much additional heat strain have I put into this thing. And you give up a lot of accuracy with them and it, you can't find that thermal drift in them as easily and we found a lot of noise in them over the time. But just removing the running mean isn't going to work because the temperature isn't constant. Okay? If you just had, you know, a little bit of thermal drift, three or four micro strain, you can take that out, the running mean circuit. But this is the unmounted circuit. And you can see up in the very left corner is the little strain gauge we saw. The next thing is that little cylinder. And that's the um, thermal, uh, gauge only, no strain, then that long lead wire, then there's actually just regular wire, strain gauge wire, and lastly there's a little circuit board 
And in that circuit board, they put all the little resistors that do what we have always known as shunt calibration. If you look at some of those data sheets, you see the little minus and plus signs up in the upper part of, for the resistances. And they give you a nominal resistance of 119 or 116. But they also show RTC plus and, and R balance minus and stuff like that. That's where you do the balancing that gives you a shunt cal. And very important thing that's on the big Vishe poster that any of you can order, they say a shunt cal does not mean you know what this calibration is. Hang dead weights or a load cell to get your calibrations, okay? So, no, I'm putting in 78 Newton meters when I hang this weight. And that equals 75 microstrain, whatever you need. That's what, you got to do it with a dead weight cow. Shunt cow just gets you balanced so that you're at a zero point. Okay, so kilo gauges, they're like our standard 120 ohm nominal uh, bridge, and uh, that bridge completion is on that little circuit board. Okay, output resistance is typically not really quite 120, and the gauge factor is typically maybe around 1.5, okay? The hot gauges come with a sexual wire. You gotta weld that down to the pipe, okay? And because it can slip just like that little strain part, it slips inside those little rings, and, but it conducts thermally. So we've now heated our lead wires to a relatively constant temperature. And they give you tabulation for the amount of lead wire that you put down. And we found the more lead wire you put down and you measure how many meters of lead wire you have, the better our answers are. When you only have 0.2 meters of lead wire and you have a 0.5 and a half, 0.55 meter potential that you could have put down, you get uh, more variation in your answers. So anyways, uh, we want to mount this gauge on the part away from the flange so we don't have any stress wires of the heated part. And basically, here's a picture of that uh, circuit completion that's in that circuit board. You can see where they're putting um, little resistors, and so you could have plus values and minus values. But at the end of the day, it, when this thing is at zero strain, I want a zero load on it, I want to see zero strain, okay? And the actual equation for calculating strain is the actual strain at the temperature is that measured strain that your EDAC is getting minus the apparent strain. That's that big sinusoidal line that's on these data sheets times two divided by the gauge factor. And the gauge factor falls off as you get hotter, but the strain can be positive or negative, the apparent strain, because it's responding to that temperature. And all those parts are responding just like you would see a thermocouple respond. Uh, and that's not a linear response curve. So we have to come up with something, and here is the whole gauge sheet, says that if I have no load, and I go to 350, here's the apparent strain I'd read. If I subtracted that, I'd get back to zero strain. That part's laying on the table, and you take an oxyacetylene torch and heat the thing up. Okay? Same as holds true for the gauge factor. Here are enumerated experimental data that they took off of that thing. And then at the very bottom is a whole bunch of equations. This is, again, that same curve. It's actually off of a different one because each of these are unique. That's a real problem because they're all unique. And here are all the equations to get you here. And you, there's about 10 of them here, okay? And if you look at equation A and you think, well, you know, you're kind of astute, and I had a professor once said the astute observer will note, some kid in the back of the room says, I'm pretty astute and I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but it wasn't me, fortunately. But anyways, you'll note the equation A looks an awful lot like that polynomial you saw in the sophomore, junior year about thermocouple equations. And that's really kind of what they're doing. And they're taking the, and some of these coefficients will have plus signs instead of minus signs, or be different in size and order of magnitude, 10 to the minus fifth as opposed to 10 to the minus sixth, depending on which strain gauge data sheet you have. Okay? so. The formula for converting it again is this measured strain minus the apparent strain times two divided by the gauge factor gives you uh, the actual microscopic strain. So for an unloaded part, 
You should always get back to zero if you can do the math and heat it up, okay? But it has to be done uniquely for each gauge at each temperature. So when we first started doing this, we developed a spreadsheet to do all this math in and calculated some constants at the front for t to the whatever and, and enumerated it all down and stuff. And then we applied, if we had a constant temperature, for example, you go out on the high-speed oval and you're going around and around and around, you're going to get pretty close to a constant temperature. But unfortunately, most of the events that you drive vary, and they may vary by 200 degrees C across. Uh, you're not going to see much variation if you look at those charts if you're only varying by 10 degrees C across a given road event. But some of them vary a lot. This is an example of a hill road event where you're going around and you're going up hills and down hills. And at the top is the uh, original data, and the bottom is the data after we've processed it. Um, and we just processed it. Suppose we had a constant temperature, and that was how we processed it. Okay? But and this flow did the equations. And here's how you can do it in uh, simply the time series calculator. Pretty simple. You pull it in. You pull out the test you want. You put all the tests back together at the end. You can, in this case, we process four different channels. So, but temperature isn't constant, I said. So we developed a glyph that calculates the equation and data sheet for each temperature. And this reproduces the curves and can be used to check our math and our data entry to get all those equations in. And what each of these little outputs to the glyph script, the scripting glyph, is, is essentially one of those equations. And then we enumerate them with the metadata uh, uh, or with the data display glyph. And we have an XY display glyph. And we can say, uh, you know, subjectively, well, we match our, our thing pretty well. And then we can go through and say, at 200 degrees C, do we get the same numbers that our enumerated tabulated form is? Yes. And I can also say, well, if I know we were running at 225 C, I can pull out the data here. And, and, you know, it allowed a lot of error checking. And here's the internals of this. Um, this is kind of the middle third. And these scripting glyphs allow you to write code in Python. And the great thing about Python or any of these is they're actual computer programming languages. So you can have while loops and for loops and do loops. Uh, and you can step through. And you can have nested loops so that you can step through. <coughs> <coughs> which means, excuse me, that I can use one thermocouple channel and I can step through either of those two strain gauges uh, or uh, on that, on, if I'm take, collecting one thermocouple channel and I can apply it to channel 37 and 38 if those were the two channels. And here it is. And one of the keys to doing all this turned out to be that you have to do K, A, M, and the length first in terms of calculating all this before you get through. And it took us a long time playing with the actual circuit and der to derive all this. Nobody comes out and tells you, by the way. So processing thermally dynamic hot string gauge data. This flow basically takes the trot files, processes them and sequentially, and then writes them out. It's real simple. It separates the temperature out here. Then we upsample the temperature. Think about temperature. Temperature has a time constant. Remember your big time constant curve from electrical circuits. It takes five time constants as, as you charge up a capacitor. OK? Well, that, um, from your perspective, it would go this way. Uh, as you uh, charge up a time constant on a capacitor, it takes five time constants. It takes five time constants for a temperature change to go up. It's just like a capacitor, a little thermocouple bead. Plus, it takes a long time for a little bead thermocouple to change. Time constant of the thermocouple might be 0.8 seconds. So five of those is four seconds. So you're not going to sample that data when you're out there taking data and you're taking 120 channels of data. You're not sampling that at 512 hertz like you are your strains or 2048 like you might be your excels. Okay? So we want to upsample it to get the same number of data points. Okay? And then we do some filtering. Just take out, the, you will see if you oversample thermocouple data, you've probably seen this. There's a little jitter in there. And, uh, and the way, one of the ways to take it out is to do some sort of 
running mean kind of calculation. Another way is to do a filter. So we upsample it, and then uh, we've got the strain gauges coming in here, and then we have our glyph. And this glyph is a lot like the other glyph, except it loops through every thermocouple data point, my apparent strain, run all these equations, spit out a data. Next thermocouple data point, next uh, measured strain, I mean, not apparent strain, calculate my apparent strain, subtract it, do all that math, spit out a data point. And then when I get through channel 37, I just go back and I've still got my uh, uh, it's a while loop, so I can still use it on channel 38 uh, on my from my original uh, thermocouple data, the way I set it up. Okay, so here's actually the data from this is actually the other side of, of this was a, on a V6 with flanges on both sides. Uh, this is the actual time history temperature data and the beginning data and after we processed it and and this is actually got should have a minus sign in front of it uh, screwed up there but anyways um, you can see that my temperature is varying from 89 degrees to 233 degrees uh, when I'm running up and down these hills and this was actually uh, taken I think this was a winter acquisition but I'm not sure like November um, so that's kind of more or less what we've been doing. Uh, are there any questions? 